amazing. This is the Open Global Mind weekly call on Thursday, July 25th, 2024. <clears throat> um, we're going to talk about democratic politics today in different ways, uh, but I would love to start the conversation by taking a beat and just having us all scroll back, scroll back into the distant past of our memories one week uh, to the time, the dark ages before last Sunday, the dark times, the, the, the deep forest where there were gremlins and goblins and ghouls and vultures in the trees and things look, they're still not maybe great, but they sure look a little bit brighter this week for if you lean slightly left. Um, even if you're in the middle, maybe if you're in the middle, you might have been concerned. So there we go. So let's take a moment and just, and I don't mean this is not a, a, a request to reenact trauma or anything like that. Just remember how you were feeling when Biden wasn't moving, when everything looked kind of grim, when, when, when. Um, and from there, we will pivot and turn into our topic for the day, which um, has a couple different interpretations, and I'd love to see which way y'all would like to go. I think the most popular version of what, what to talk about today is what to do now. Um, other things that could be done are the sharing of intelligence so that we're up to date about what's up, what we think is happening. Uh, another alternative is alternate strategies, like thinking strategically about uh, what's going to happen between now and November and Election Day. Uh, or uh, you could add another variant in here as well. Um, so I'm open, the floor is open for suggestions, or we can just uh, plow ahead with what um, what to do now. Thoughts? Bueller? Well, I'm, Bueller? Go ahead, go ahead, Doug. I'm really impressed by how rapid the mind shift has been throughout the entire country probably the world, uh, much bigger than I think any of us anticipated. It's like a, a little breeze of fresh air passed through, uh, and it was unanticipated. And why I think this is so interesting is I've been looking for big effects that could affect climate change. And here is something that's on the scale of what is possible. Uh, and I don't think it's the content is there, but the psychology of a shift of mindset from something that everybody thinks they believe to something that they believe a week later is just amazing. Um, I love that. And, and it was one thing to get the news that Biden was going to step aside. It was another thing to watch the next 48 hours and to watch 44,000 women from Win With Black Women show up on a call and raise over a million dollars. And then the next day, 50,000 black men show up on a similar call and raise over a million dollars. And lots and lots of people just on fire about this. And I, I, Hank is saying in the chat, don't count your chickens before they hatch. Totally true. And my hope here is that um, the left is truly lit up for multiple months right now to go do everything in their power, everything in their power, uh, that is legitimate and legal because there's precedent on the other side that doesn't run that way so much, uh, but everything to make this work. Um, so yes, Stacy, please. Yeah, I want to follow off of what Doug said because what I realized, I was listening to somebody, it was a gentleman, and he was talking about the grief from the climate crisis. And it was the first time I realized that most of the men don't understand that that same grief that some of you are familiar with with the climate crisis has been the grief, <clears throat> excuse me, that many, many, many women and marginalized people have been feeling throughout the entire Trump presidency and after. And it just was like, oh, they don't understand. So I'm not surprised that this shift happened so quickly not surprised at all. And I just want us to keep in mind that Trump won the presidency using the media as a weapon. That's an important weapon. And if we wanna defeat an enemy, we have to look at what the enemy is using 
and have that mindset. Now, Stacey, you're leaning into the strategy conversation right there, which I love because that's sort of my meat and potatoes, which is not a very vegetarian or earth-friendly thing to say anymore. Um, but, um, but, but thank you that I, I agree. And yeah. I think, I think different men have different degrees of awareness or awakeness about other people's situations. Um, my favorite saying on this, I've said it many a time on OGM calls is the privilege of privilege is not noticing the privilege yeah. because you're and not, not to say there's not empathy. I mean, yeah. we all, the empathy is there. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm yeah. saying that real, like, isn't the same. I'm, I'm with you. Go ahead, Klaus. Yeah, the Hartman report uh, this morning uh, is is uh, talking about a lawsuit that Trump filed and got accepted in Florida against ABC and Stephanopoulos, who um, uh, mentions that Trump is a convicted felon for, or got convicted for rape. And to say that on the air, so it's a completely bogus lawsuit if you believe in the in, in free speech but uh it's this attempt to silence the the, the media you know that uh, that you've seen in hungary and that you see in in places where you have an authoritarian get into into office there's a really interesting moment right now to shift discourse toward positive things and to just play up the difference between a party that is all negative and trying to shut things down and scare people um, and a party that is not. And I don't know that that's how this is going to play out, but it's a, it's a very sharp contrast that showed up in the last couple of days. It's like Kamala shows up on stage in her first couple of speeches. And she's like, we can do this. We can do that. We can do this. We can do that. You know, let's go. Um, let's figure this thing out. And her the contrasts are wonderful. And in particular, uh, Trump's nickname for her is Laughing Kamala. And I'm like, she got good reason to laugh, man. She's a prosecutor running against a felon. <clears throat> oh my God, I mean, that's just the, the tip of the iceberg. It's, she has lots of good reasons to laugh and can own that one. So plenty going on there. Other, other thoughts, other angles. What to do now? Well, she's caught in the dilemma between talking about having a stronger economy which of course makes the climate problem worse. So there's two things to do, uh, one of which is gonna be very unpopular with a lot of people. So there's, I think there's, if I were her and her planners uh, and her staff, I'd be thinking for between now and November, you don't, you don't yank to the far left, you hew toward the middle and you talk about things that will appeal to the heart of the country and you win the election. Um, then you defend the Inflation Reduction Act, you defend all of the investments already made to reduce greenhouse and you double down and you can, you know, you can have an agenda. And last I heard, the president is now immune from just about everything. So that should come in handy now and then. Um, well, so that's that's great unless we have a climate crisis that uh, begins to overwhelm society between now and election. Does anybody think that there's going to be a climate crisis that big between now and November? Uh, like, yeah. It's, yes. it's totally possible because the Gulf of Mexico is so is a bathtub. I mean, it's so warm, right? Anything going in there, and as we've seen already, anything that makes it into the Gulf of Mexico is going to spin up. Um, so that that's absolutely you know a, a possibility. And then the other thing, which I pointed out several times that no one is paying attention to, is that you have global impacts to the food supply. Um, I mean, when you when you look. All over the world, China, India, Africa, and South America, you have massive uh, 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 impacts on uh, on crops. You know, when we, I mean, the, an entire state in Brazil was underwater, uh, and, and so they can't get the equipment into the field and so on. So when you aggregate, you know, what's happening on a global level, it's 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 really quite serious. So I agree with what you're saying, Klaus. But between now and November. You think a systemic collapse of the entire food system that causes enough distress to change the agenda is going to happen? I, I agree with, with with Doug and Klaus. We're on an emergency footing, but now to November is the window. Yeah, what I can see. It's going to happen all, all at once. It's going to happen piecemeal. But those pieces are helping and happening already. And we're going to get an aggregate measure of what's happening. Yesterday was the hottest day ever. The system. 
Yesterday was the hottest day ever. The day before was the hottest day ever also. So it broke its and own. And tomorrow will be hotter, not less. Um, so so the numbers are spiking. I, I'm I'm with you on that. I just yep. don't think I just don't think those consequences a cascade out to events that fast and b make it through the news and change everybody's opinion that fast. There's a non-zero chance that you're going to have a storm hitting Houston, hitting the oil fields, or hitting uh, in that in that area there that would give the opportunity to declare a state of emergency. I, I see that you know, as, as uh, a perfect uh, a transition point you know, to change the conversation and, and to seriously start focusing on, on the, the mess we're in. And Stacey, you were trying to step in. Yeah, so to go back to why I was pushing for Buttigieg as VP, aside from the fact that he is very good at messaging to regular ordinary people, he has already been faced with many, many crises in terms of managing things and whether or not people see things as being a crisis of climate or whatever it is, it's, they're still going to see these crises that you talk about. And it's, I think that the combination of him and Kamala are going to focus on Biden's accomplishments, what he's already done. I think he's trustworthy, you know, like people all across the political spectrum can look at him as being trustworthy. And I think that it's going to tie MAGA's hands at attacking him because they can't go after the cultural attacks because look at him. He's the most traditional family values person that you could see. So I just want to throw that out there. Thanks, Stacey. Hank, it looks like you want to step in, but I'm not sure. I think you might just be squinting at the screen. Well, uh, yeah, I was squinting at the screen. Uh, I'm going to keep quiet for a while. Uh, later on, I might have some things to add. I mean, obviously, I've been following everything that happens, but I've been following it uh, almost exclusively through the BBC and the Dutch television networks to get two views on uh, what's going on in America and two different sets of commentators than the ones I would get if I were watching CNN or uh, or Fox News, which you can also get here. Uh, I just want to make one comment about uh, MAGA. Uh, MAGA has put people in a trance for, I guess, uh, eight years or, or longer. It's like an addiction. It's like a uh, an enchantment or a spell or a curse. And uh, it's not going to help people really pay attention to what's happening or listen to what's happening. Uh, and that in connection with the possibility of, of, a, of a climate collapse, uh, even if there is a climate collapse, I don't believe uh, MAGA Republicans would even pay attention to it. Thanks, Hank. Um, on the question of what to do now, uh, donate more, make phone calls, uh, do something different. Because y'all were enthusiastic about this on the mailing list. So I'm like, well, good. OK, let's go there. Uh, Mr. Jones. Okay, there it is. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I've been part of this before and getting out the vote is extremely effective and getting out the vote and then being directed to call to the swing states is really effective i was with somebody this morning and they're doing deep canvassing training here uh in uh, all over north carolina and deep canvassing is where you talk to people who disagree and that is longer term but the thing you can do now is calling people who are leaning and calling people who have said they are committed is extremely effective in getting out the vote. So I don't see that there's a lot of mystery. Um, Stacey Abrams did well in Georgia in the last major election by using a lot of deep canvassing and managed to tip, tip the scales toward uh, not only the general election, but also the two senators. Uh, the mm -hmm. Senate seat and so forth. So really important. Um, other thoughts? And postcard campaigns. 
those are pretty effective. Okay. So, so what's an opening? What do you say to people who are likely Trump voters? What's 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 the opening salvo? It's being trained in deep canvassing. So that's you don't start there. You, you reach people who are leaning, and you reach people who want to do it, and then they have postcards written for you. You, know, I, you don't know what to say, and I don't know what to say. So you know you have to be. So basically, follow the scripts. I have found that to be really effective, and it's seen that it worked. You know, it didn't work well with Hillary, but nobody liked. I mean, it was we couldn't even get a group together to do uh, calls together with Hillary. It was it was terrible, a terrible experience, really. Wow. With Obama, two times we met in a place, and then we kept had a movie uh, every month afterwards. You know, there was a community. There was no community around Hillary. That's cool. Um, a, right, so I think a, the, ahead, the deep canvassing is really powerful and important, but I think the larger issue from a historical point of view is, uh, is Harris going to be pushing for a faster, swifter, more productive growing economy or not? If she does, she's going to get trapped. I think she's going to spend the time talking about what's already been accomplished I, 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 and drawing the comparisons between her and the con. Uh, the economic numbers in the last couple of days were really good. The Biden, Bidenomics does appear to be working. It's just that that message not, doesn't get through at all. That, that doesn't, appear, doesn't appear to be turning anybody's We're not facing up to the fact that people's concern about the economy is not in dollar terms. But in terms of the relationship of what you can buy to having a place in the culture, and people feel disenfranchised at the cultural level, not at the financial level. Right. And that's why I think that the message she's going to be pushing are going to let the people that are affected by that feel, oh, wow, they're really doing something. Because what I'm telling you is that people on the street don't even realize what's been happening the misinformation that they have is making them think of gloom and doom when actually the, the proposals that biden has started and the programs that he started are leading us in a good direction the numbers show we're going in a good direction but they don't know it but as it's being spoken about and they look at the people around them saying yes yes this is all happening it changes the emotions of everything. And that's why in a week we see such a big difference. It, those, those emotional things and people's perceptions change really quickly. Um, also, Doug, um, I think what you just described as people's con connection to things, not for the economics of it, but for the cultural aspects of it, I think that's like part and parcel of consumerism, which we've been marinating in for a really long time. And it's how consumer goods sell themselves to our, to us. It's like, Form your identity by buying Nike instead of Puma or whatever. And I'm not sure people are frustrated on that front. They can still buy their Ford F-150. They can still, you know, the, the stuff they want to get as cultural markers. Uh, can you say a little more about what you meant by their frustration on that, on that dimension? Yeah, I think uh, for this middle America, the way they look at their family is that there's no longer a ladder for their kids to move up in society. That's I'm different sure that from cultural get... markers, though. That's not the, the no, thing you were just no, saying. No, because up the ladder is cultural more than it is financial. They're related, but the cultural is really important. You don't have a place in a viable society. That's deep, and I think it's extremely widespread. So you're saying we can't all be Uber drivers? Just kidding. That's that's just irony. Yeah. Never mind me. Yeah. Um, interesting. Um, uh, Pete, please. Um, I have I have a observation, maybe not a thought. I have an observation about what we what might be done right now. Um, it seems like um, it seems like the VP pick could be uh, highly influential in in a couple ways. One of them is actually getting uh, Kamala uh, elected. And then the other one is the direction of her, um, of her, 
presidency. So take, for instance, the difference between Buttigieg uh, and Pritzker. Um, uh, Buttigieg is, I, I, I kind of think of him as somebody who the, I, I, I like your argument, Stacey, that he would be a good pick because he's, he would be hard to assail. Um, I don't feel that way. I feel like um, he's so good hearted that, that somehow MAGA would figure out a way to make him look uh, silly and childish uh, to their base at least, um, while making him actually probably look more virtuous to the left. Uh, so I, I kind of worry about, you know, it, I, I, I like the idea of him as a VP pick, and I kind of also wonder if that would be uh, bad. Pritzker, on the other hand, uh, you know, rich billionaire, uh, uh, kind of feisty politician, um, uh, maybe a good pick to get elected, but then having him in, you know, uh, a heartbeat away and, and in the, um, in the cabinet structure kind of moves, uh, maybe moves the U.S. more towards plutocracy or oligarchy. Um, even while it looks like a comfortable, you know, safe bet, um, maybe it's maybe it's not the way that we want to go. Um, so, I and now is maybe a time where you could you could actually maybe influence that a little bit. Let me reply for just one second to Pete, and then I'll go Stacy, and then Koss. Um, it's funny of the candidates who are likely running mates. Buttigieg is the only one I've watched go on Fox TV and other kinds of Republican media and slice and dice them and get a standing ovation at a at a town hall meeting at four or five years ago uh, from a conservative audience. He he absolutely knows how to go in there with his little rapier and do it. I think he might be like too elite, too smart, too whatever sounding to everybody to, to actually sort of connect. So there's other reasons why I'm not sure it's Buttigieg. I've heard some really interesting things like how about Lynn Cheney as the vice presidential uh, option or something like that, something bipartisan that's kind of crazy where Lynn Cheney's social programs would pretty much be at the opposite end of the park from uh, from Kamala's, but, but the combination is really interesting. It says, we believe in bipartisanship and let's go. Uh, and Lynn might make a really excellent partner at that level. I don't know. But two women on the ticket is also a possibly problematic. Uh, so there's a whole bunch of interesting things going on, puzzles being being uh, pieced to piece through. This week, uh, I hope I hope Jason Miller is losing a lot of sleep. That's uh, Trump's chief speechwriter and strategist. I hope he is not getting a lot of sleep. That's that's my wish for him these days. Uh, Stacy then Klaus. Yeah, I just wanted to say that. Keep in mind that the target should be people who aren't already voting Democrat. And to my mind, those are the independents. And I think um, in the piece that um, I think it was, I don't remember who shared it, but it was Cory Doctorow's piece. It might have been either Gil or Kevin. I don't remember where he took Project 2025. And I, I don't remember the whole thing, but I remember saying, yeah, it, it's, the ind so the independence that, so the guy that Pete mentioned, Pritzka, who I don't even know, I would stay away from any millionaires because to one group of people that we would want to target, they're the ones that wanted to break up the system that don't want to see the, mil the billionaires running the show. So I would stay away from those people and I would stay away from, unfortunately, I'm speaking as a Jewish person, but anything that could bring attention to Israel or Judaism that could tie into these crazy conspiracy Q people, the Jewish cabal, I'd stay away from that. <laughs> so I go back to the P what it going with Buttigieg and the homosexuality and the fact that half the Republican Party is closeted. Um, I think it show it takes the hoods off of the KKK. It shows us who these people are. And I know just talking in my local community, where I call it the cesspool, I've seen the dynamic shift just by things that I've been saying and a couple of other people now not being afraid to add on and the censorship issues. And so I just wanted to say, look at who we're tart, look at who we want, not who we already have on board. Uh, Stacey, I agree with your call on billionaires, yet find it deliciously ironic that Trump, uh, Trump, the possible billionaire, seems to somehow have the hearts of all these people who would nominally hate billionaires. Like, isn't that crazy? 
And, 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 and one of the things I say about him is that Trump is a better caricature of the greedy billionaire than Thurston Howell III from Gilligan's Island. Like Trump pulls it off better than a cartoon character from a sitcom. That, and, and, and I think that's part of his appeal, frankly. Um, Klaus. Yeah, I would, I would uh, stay focused on, on the economy and the transformation that is pending in the economy, uh, which is, in my mind, a reason why Trump gets so much support from the oligarchs, because he's basically um, promising to do whatever, right? I mean, he, he has, uh, he would put people into office uh, that, um, that protect, you know, the, the, for example, the oil industry, you know, food industry, and so on. Um, and, and I've said before, you know, the insanity of this, because that's exactly how other strong men came into power, from Mussolini to Hitler to Franco, you know, in Chile, Pinochet. I mean, all of that, all of these guys came into power because uh, they were elevated in there by uh by the the industrial elites um so the 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 challenge that that Kamala will have is to is to not threaten the these these uh um power centers uh and promise or or, or assure you know a reasonable transition uh where um where companies that are that are really looking uh, at uh, at a, at an abyss, quite frankly, uh, and I can only speak for the food industry, but you see the same in the in the energy sector. You know, you have uh, um, legacy systems worth trillions of dollars uh, uh, centered around the combustion engine, and here comes the electric car and the electric everything. Now, so in the food system, you have the same thing. Now, the the uh, uh, consensus that has been building up is that it needs to be broken up, decentralized, localized, regionalized. That is a massive uh, uh, change for uh, uh, very powerful global companies, Nestle, Cargill, Kellogg, you name them. Now, so um, I think it will become really important to to create uh, uh, a, a, a transition uh, a perspective, right? That uh, allows you know, the, the, a, a reasonable wave of adaptation and nothing really radical. Because, I mean, let's face it, the media is controlled you know, by um, um, the same people who uh, uh, control these uh, status quo uh, legacy systems, and and the the impact of the media is you know, extremely powerful. So over time, I mean, we have a few more months to go. They will find out. They will find a way to erode you know, the the enthusiasm that we that we see here short term. Um, so so that's that's. Um, I, I think that's an important thing to focus on. You know, so to make sure that uh, we don't create hostilities you know, with uh, with the industry. Um, I want to come back to what you just said, Klaus, in a second. I just remembered uh, Timothy Snyder wrote a really great piece on how to avoid uh, tyranny. He's the historian who's really good on Ukraine and has, has done a whole series of classes on the history of Ukraine and how that mess happened. But he also wrote a book on, on tyranny. 20 lessons from the 20th century. And this post basically summarizes them. And then I added my brain link to it because I summarized out the 20 lessons so that you can kind of see them separately just in a, at a glance. Um, and then Klaus, you, you said nothing really radical. And I want to I want to unpack that a little bit with everyone, because on the one hand, one radical thing that I don't think I don't think would work well is a sharp swing to the left where suddenly she says, Green New Deal is back on. That is our big agenda. We're going to go do this, 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 this of a very, very left program. I'm, I'm more in Stacey's camp, which is like, right this minute, appeal to the middle of the damn country. And then, then I have this other thought of, you want actually to rock the boat in some ways that are meaningful and noticeable. You don't want to just, I don't think she just wants to sort of stay and be predictable in her lane. One of, one of Trump's big assets to the far right is that he has shredded the Overton window of discourse. He is unpredictable. He has made himself 
leeway, license, permission. He's, he's torn this open hole in the social fabric to say just about anything and everything he wants, where the Democrats are in this tight little circle where anything they do will get them canceled, not by the MAGAs, by themselves. And you can't do anything interesting when you're when you're in a straitjacket, when you're handcuffed by your own group and your own people. So I think that nothing really radical might, I'm really interested in radical things like, hey, let's actually talk about the issues in an open forum. Let's let's practice some democracy here uh, and let, let's go deeper. And, and instead of campaign speech, campaign speech, campaign speech in swing states uh, to basically say, look, I showed up here, go to a swing state and actually have a conversation about these things, run a forum, do something interesting that people be like, ah, crap. Uh, admit that liberal approaches towards certain policies didn't work and figure out how to work with the other side to make policies that, that work going forward. That's radical to me is like not doing the, pre everything predictable she does between now and November probably contributes to a squeaky narrow victory, but anything she does to disrupt the tone and nature of the conversation in a positive way, I think might actually turn into a really positive balance on, in, at the at election time because people are tired of the same old thing. People are people are exhausted of politics as usual, I think. Um, Supreme Court reform, like packing the court, maybe, although that would be seen, that would I think that would be seen as, as like gaming the system uh, in order to get advantage while you still have the administration. You're muted. What you just said, though, about people are tired of politics as usual, I'm talking about just tapping into freedom, justice, accountability. It's not fair. We're, you know, talking to people like me, you know, it's not fair. We want accountability. We don't want our rights taken away. The Supreme, you know, and focusing on, you know, the the bribery in the Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. Oh, the, the SCOTUS is just so crazy right now. Just so crazy. Um, and I just want to say, I don't even know how to say this. It's a campaign. I mean, it, it's really a campaign. Why do we have to have like these super, super high standards? Like it, it's 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 advertising. Like, why do we have to be better than the other side in, in this approach? How do you mean that? You mean we should lower ourselves to Trump's discourse standards? No. No, I don't mean that at all. I mean okay, the things good, we're good. I mean that the things we're talking about are adequate. We don't have to get so to the root of everything. We just have to create a good commercial. You know, it's not the average person that's going to be sitting in the room and making policy. We just need the people on the ground that are causing all the noise that give politicians the cover to do the things that they do. Mm -hmm. One of the things I love about the last week, well, it hasn't even been a week since Sunday, is that um, the, the right side of the equation has barely been in the news. Like some of them are trying to sue to say that say, to say that Kamala is not legitimate, that they can't do this, whatever. You know, that sounds like nattering on the sides. And Trump and his and his cohort have to be furious and fuming. This is why I said Jonathan Miller is probably losing sleep because they want to own the media cycle every week all the time, and they know that that's a victory. So Stacey, when you say that it's a media battle and they should just we should just make good ads, I'm, I'm with you on, on that a bunch. Um, I think that what Trump did was he hacked old media and new media better than anybody else knew how to. And that's really important and interesting. So since Kamala got the reins, I had never, never heard about the K, the K hive, which is apparently her uh, her posse. I'd never heard about the coconut tree meme, which is a thing. And now we've got uh, Yes We Can, which is also a meme. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff happening that's different and sort of organic and funny, and I think is going to carry pretty well. I don't know. Just one quick question I want to yeah. ask everybody here. How And you could show with Pam. How much do you think of the turnaround in the past week in terms of support behind Kamala has to do with social media. Because I think it was huge and I think it happened in two days. And that's for me being there. So I just want to know if you guys see that or not. <laughs> I don't, I'm thinking maybe you don't, which is fine, but I just want to know for sure. 
as for me, not being on TikTok and having abandoned X since Musk took over and all that, I'm not, and I'm not and checking Facebook maybe every month. I'm not on the media enough to have seen whether that's what tipped it, but I'm extremely impressed, as I said a little bit earlier, with the really quick turnaround and show up of a whole mess of people on this. And I, I you know, and I've noticed that there's a couple of people on the Democratic side who are like, hey, wait a minute, we didn't get to do this democratically. This just kind of got foisted. And I get that. But the unison is unexpected and fabulous. And so, so the shift I, I'm seeing, I don't know what its causes necessarily. And just so you know, I'm only on Facebook and specifically only on Facebook for a reason. Mm -hmm. And I personally think that all of the small donations that have come in are reflective of what I'm talking about. And um, money, money, how, what? Yeah, I was going to say, um, Facebook allowed Trump back on the platform just a month or two ago. Has that made any difference to what you're seeing? Oh, I don't even notice it. No. Okay. Um, so, I, so he's I'm not having any about, death there. No, I'm talking about what I notice in terms of the way messages travel. You know, I mean, we talked about here how it was 12 accounts that led to the whole COVID misinformation thing. I'm talking about things like that, how the climate changed within Facebook and how the act flu donations, what was it like 89 million in the first 24 hours? These were small donor donations that changed the, you know, if you think about Facebook as a world, as a virtual world where we know each other, we see the connections with each other, we change our neighborhoods. Pete? Um, thanks. Thanks for the view uh, into a uh, social media world, Stacy. Um, not to disagree, um, but uh, another thing I see is um, a. I, I I think a lot of it was driven by um, uh, by the news and by uh, the decision of uh, Democratic politicians to uh, endorse Kamala. So. A, a, a different story, another story, not to say that it replaces or I, I, I don't I don't know how to judge the magnitude of social media versus news. But um, but I think a thing that happened was we had, as Jerry kind of intimated at the beginning of the call, we had a pressure cooker situation where it was getting worse and worse and worse and worse. And so we had a month or whatever of, um, you know, Joe, please go. Um, and that was, I think, a a, a cultural um, uh, cultural feeling driven by social media, I'm sure, and I think also by the news, um, and also I think by people talking like us, talking amongst each other. Right? Oh my God, the world is going to end, and Joe is at the at the helm, and he can't he can't get you know he can't move. He's a dog in the manger. Um, we're going to die this way because Joe can't get himself out. Um, and so we had this pressure cooker situation where everybody, I think a lot of people, anybody who knew anything about uh, politics was like, oh my God, we're effed. Um, and then all of a sudden, the, the, we popped the lid off that. Joe said, well, I, I'm stepping down and I endorsed Kamala. And the thing that 48 hours after that, the thing that I was watching was, well, um, the, to me, the Democratic Party um, uh, I think Miha Sifri has a, has a, a, a nice thing. He calls it, uh, he calls somebody else calling it the blob, the democratic blob. There isn't a party anymore. There's not a cohesive party. There's all these other things around the party who aren't part of the official thing, but have kind of more power than the party itself. I, you know, the proof of the pudding was that the democratic party couldn't tell uh, Joe or wasn't able to tell Joe, maybe they finally got to him. They weren't able to tell him, hey, dude, you're, you're messing everything up for us. You know, you're messing up the future. You're messing up your legacy. Just move, and then and then we can get together. I was expecting that un inability of the Democrats to be cohesive, to just continue and to have like two weeks or four weeks or or God forbid whatever until the election, of them just kind of milling around and infighting and stuff like that. But instead, what happened was one by one they fell in line. Comma, 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 comma. So, and then you know that that pressure cooker situation where everything was like we're totally screwed. Uh, within, I, I told Joanne, and I was thinking about the open AI thing. Uh, my wife, um, uh, 
and I, I said, you know, after after Joe made his decisions, 12 hours later, I'm saying, you know, Silicon Valley would have fixed this by now. Um, and the open AI thing, or, you know, take somebody like Musk, the news, uh, they get together in Silicon Valley and they make this amazing decision of competing interests and stuff like that very quickly, right? I, I was just blown away to see the Democrats be able to pull that together. Um, emergently, apparently, out of, you know, chaos, all of a sudden they're all aligned and they're all singing the same song and they're all together. And so, so to me, I'm sure social media was, uh, you know, a, a groundswell underneath that, but there's also something else going on, which was uh, a huge amount of cultural pressure built up and then released in a positive way, um, largely, you know, just however you get the news, you know, whether it's across the fence with your neighbor or it's, uh, you know, Apple news or whatever, however you, you saw the news is like, wow, um, it's a new day. Finally, there's a new day. So I think that's a lot of the, you know, of what happened and what, where the pivot was. And I think it was kind of all over. Um, thanks, Pete. Uh, Klaus. Yeah, whichever way it happened, clearly, uh, this was a well-prepared strategy because uh, Camilla released, the, I mean, her, her, her the campaign released an ad that, that couldn't just have been put together on the fly. Um, and uh, that, so, so they were absolutely prepared. And I don't know if, I mean, who knows, but uh, if this was just, uh, they had put them preparing themselves in case of, or if this was, uh, if there was any more coordination behind that, in any case, um, what the what the Trump campaign expected was a drawn out selection process, counting on uh, uh, Kamala being, you know, not well liked, uh, you know, being uh, uh, maybe you know, an unlikely candidate, and having a big uh, debate at the Democratic convention. You know, to pick a candidate which would have given them a wide open field you know, to to uh, to campaign on on the Republican side and instead this this split streak here what I call it right um, was just an amazing and it had to be prepared there's no way you know that you can that you can do this from a cold start so whoever thought of it and whoever, uh, executed it, kudos, right? I mean, this was this was uh, pretty impressive to see. So there was a story after the French election where at the first pass of the election, it looked horrible. And then there was a turnaround and there's a woman named Marine Dondelier. Um, uh, and the Times wrote an article, France's left has a new star and a fresh crisis. But she apparently was one of the catalysts for bringing all the French progressives and far left together to like change their votes around and drop out candidates and all that so that the second pass election was a big win for uh, the middle and the left. Um, and that, I think that's really interesting. Now, uh, you had to, you'd have to be blind and dumb to not be strategizing while Biden was saying, nope, I'm still the candidate. You know, I'm not leaving. I'm still going to be here. You had, you'd have to be pretty blind to not be preparing for him to step down. Uh, and then the question becomes, hey, what can we do? I mean, I'm reminded that before Trump won in 2016, there was the Brexit vote in England. And I was like, oh, that's that's really bad. I hope that's not a harbinger of things to come. It was sort of like a, a little thought I had when the Brexit vote happened. And sure enough, it, 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 it seems, seems like it was in some sense. It may just be coincidence, but I think there was a wave running through, uh, you know, humans. Uh, so... I'm, I'm curious about how this all plays out in all of our heads. Scott, please. Yes, um, Klaus, very interesting insight there about how quickly this happened. And it, I, I'm asking the group because I'm not sure, but it seems to me that a quick pivot is the opposite of a conservative orientation. And I, I don't know if that's true or not. So another, you know, typically a, a, more liberal orientation is more open, aware, gray lines between things, as I've often talked about. How many borders, how high should the wall be is, is like a great psychological way to think about the two sides. 
more walls, higher walls, bigger walls, clearer definitions between categories, between physical and conceptual categories, more open borders, more blending, more fluidity between the borders, lower walls, no walls. And it seems to me that an unexpected pivot, a quick pivot is sort of the opposite of a conservative mindset. And I don't know if that's true or not. It's just something that occurred to me. Can you say more what you mean by conservative? I don't think by, you mean capital what, C conservative, like the conservative party. I don't I, think you mean that. No, no, I mean, I mean, conservative in the definition of how like, like personality orientation. So I want things to be like they, to stay as they are. I want my categories to be clear. I want things to be known and quantified and stable. I, I don't want things bleeding over into other things. I want things to be organized. And that's, it's just something I've been pondering about because I don't want things to change. I don't want new things. I don't, you know, that, that to me has been a nice way to frame a more conservative mindset and a more liberal mindset is we're open to change. We want, we're, um, categories are less clear. We want things to be blended. We want borders to be open, ideas to flow, that sort of thing. And that's kind of what I'm talking. I'm not talking about conservative. I'm, I'm talking about conservative underlying why people align with a conservative party more so than if, if that makes any sense. It does. Okay. Um, so do you well, think there's well, anything to that? I don't know that a pivot is like especially disorienting for a more conservative mindset. Um, we've got several people. Uh, Doug, I don't know if you were signaling to talk, were you? Yeah. So Doug, yes. then Stacy. So what I hear is from Scott's view that the conservatives and the let's call them progressives, whatever are both motivated by the fact that the underlying society is changing. And one group wants to hold on to what they have, and the other group feels we've got to change in order to cope. But neither of them are motivated internally. They're in reaction to ex external events. Stacy, I agree. And I was just going to say that a person with a liberal mindset, a liberal way of thinking, tends to be more center left and a person with a conservative mindset, just in terms of the way of thinking tends to go to the right. I think that I personally find that to be true. The, the reason I started thinking about that a couple of years ago is I, I learned that in the big five personality model, orderliness correlated with conservative party and openness correlated with liberal party. And it was that the only, sense category of the personality model that actually tied to a political party. And I found that fascinating. Thank you, Doug. That was a great insight. I appreciate that. Um, a thought, which is um, the so-called conservative party has done a really sharp pivot from being very anti-communist and Russia haters to being Putin lovers. And I find that intriguing. I find that they don't seem to, they, they're not troubled by this and they, they have not responded in any way that shows a weakness around this, which amazes me, just amazes me. <clears throat> like th these are John Birchers way back in the day who were ardently, ardently anti-communist anti um, who are suddenly now like taking policy decisions and making a whole bunch of, uh, taking a whole bunch of stands that favor Putin and kind of clearly favor Putin. And I, I don't understand that. And, and it, it, it seems to, counter what you just said about conservatism. It's a huge pivot. When you bring, when they bring, when it comes up in their conversations though, then you see the fighting between them. Part of the reason you don't see it is because they don't discuss it enough. They don't really agree, but because there is no open conversation in those discussions, you're not noticing it. There's a very interesting sort of herding and bundling of conservative people by the conservative party that's been going on for 30, 40 years, uh, oh, no. since since at least Gingrich and probably well before him. But but Gingrich sort of 
was a great shepherd of the flock because he's the one who separated the conservatives from the, the, the Democrats from the Republicans. He's the one who said, if you don't stay on message, we're not going to give you any money for your primary. Uh, he, he did a whole bunch of things that still affect us and still damage our democracy to this day. I, I, I lay a lot of this at his feet. Doug, is that you um, wanting to talk or is that you managing the interface of your Zoom call? Okay, mm -hmm. good. Um, other thoughts? Anybody hopeful, not hopeful? What are you thinking? Where are you now? Stacey, you're hopeful. Well, I, I'm looking for what the world is going to be like post-election. Uh, and I think that who's ever in power is going to be coping with incredibly huge problems uh, that are probably going to feel like they're swamping the whole system. Uh, so the ability to get society ready for that crisis time uh, is occupying my thinking. Agreed. Uh, John, please. That was the one of the right buttons. Sorry, yeah, sorry. Uh, no, I'm 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 a little slow on the trigger, and I'm still thinking about the previous um, subject. Uh, kind of like what's what's entering my mind is like the agility of a pivot and the fragility of a reluctance to pivot, right? And I'm thinking about I'm wondering because I'm not really really deep in the political thing. Um, like I don't have a really strong, I'm kind of a one issue at a time kind of guy, but um, I'm wondering if if that isn't ultimately kind of where President Biden diverged, I guess, from his support base is when he started displaying that fragility of an inability to pivot, right? Like, the party was calling for at least consideration of that. And I just think he, he showed a, from my point of view, he showed an increasingly rigid and non, non agile response, you know, to that question. And he kept giving the same answer. And meanwhile, everyone around him started giving a different answer. He stuck to his, in, he, I guess you could frame it that he stuck to his principle of don't quit, you know, or something like that, which I'm I'm a fan of, you know. Um, I mean, I buy, I believe that or whatever from athletics and just you know stick to itiveness and um, persistence and these things. But anyway, just an observation. I'm wondering if, like, for those that that are maybe deeper into that world, if if you if you see that the same way or something. And Scott, I think your yeah your point was really really an interesting one. I think. Um, John, I was really turned off by Biden in his couple of public pronouncements during the pressure cooker phase when he was saying nobody's telling me to resign or to, just to step aside, not resign. Nobody's telling me to step out. And I'm like, if if nobody's actually telling you that you need to step out of the race, then you have the wrong set of advisors because there is like a people are barbarians are at the gate right now. And your inner guard is like cooking you an omelet instead of telling you the news. So, so that, that really turned me off. And I think it came from show no weakness the, the moment you sort of declare any kind of crack that, you know, the water will pour into that crack and you're done. But I, I don't think that's true. Although we in, we're in a very weird political moment. Well, it was the same problem that Hillary had of saying, everything is fine, a vote for me. Uh, and people do not feel that everything is fine, but their disagreement with the trend of events is deeper than economic. Other thoughts? Where else, uh, what, what do you wish would happen? What um, me, what would an ideal path forward look like? Go ahead, Hank. Let, let me just ask a question. Uh, who is Who are the real important influencers in, uh, in America uh, these days? Uh, are there 20 or 40 or, or, or 200 people who we all know by name? Then they're the ones who have to tell the right stories to get the Democrats elected? Well, 
was looking, I was uh, watching parts of an interview of a conversation between uh, Peterson and Musk yesterday. Um, and I mean, I mean, both of them are like really sketchy characters, but that sounds like an interesting conversation, though. <laughs> it was that. Um, but Peterson uh, asked, put, put Musk on the spot of saying, what happens when oligarchs control or when money you know, controls the political process? And the outcome is always hegemony and, and uh, uh, you know, authoritarianism. It always ends up to be a mess. And Musk basically agreed with them. And then in that interview, uh, he was saying that this $45 million per month uh, contribution to uh, uh, to uh, Trump is a fake story. He goes, I never said that, and it's not happening. Oh, uh, yeah. what? Yeah. That's interesting. But, uh, uh, wait, who never said, wait, wait, Musk never said it or Trump never said it? Musk never said it. Trump announced it in, on his rallies. Um, but uh, it but, made the news, it made the news somewhere. I, I have no idea what it's origin. No, no, I heard it, I heard it. But what I'm asking is so Musk said he's never said he would give it, or Musk never said he never said he would take it away. He, he said he never, he never made that comment. Uh, it's fake, it's a fake news story. Which Trump uh, apparently propagated, um, and that so he he donated a much smaller amount than that to set up a PAC, and then Jordan, you know, asked him to explain to the public what a PAC is and 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 how does this uh, work within the political process. I thought it was actually a pretty good conversation, you know, because it it showed he put Musk on the spot of saying so you're really using your money. To to move the political process your way, right? And and uh, and so yeah, I mean it's interesting to watch. You know, pictures put it in there, and, uh, sort of speed through it. Um, but I I mean it it really brings out how uh, very wealthy people are putting a lot of money into the process. You know, having their think tanks in there, having very highly paid people spent you know full time on developing messaging to screw this thing up uh, and then move it their way uh, so it's uh, and I, I think the the challenge now is uh, to to create uh, some positivity in all this saying you know we are the one country in the world that can actually drive change and that actually has the know-how the capacity the flexibility to uh, to to move us into you know a new direction, um, and and without that, I mean we need to we need to get into a positive mode, you know that doesn't just because Trump right now is just slinging the worst insults. I mean I don't know if you watched some of that yesterday. I mean it's just horrendous to watch what this guy is saying in to, you know in his rallies, and then he's suing ABC. For mentioning that he lost the lawsuit for get, for raping someone, I, I mean, you know, the so so they they lift they're using the the uh, 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 judicial process, the the legal system, to fight you know, while they themselves engage in the most horrendous uh, acts. There, it's a it's really an onslaught. I mean, it is brutal you know, uh, how this comes, and and so uh, without pulling the the uh, industrial or the the economic system into the process and and uh, uh, have them wake up that you can't have this guy lead the economy you know this is going to be a, a shipwreck um, that that message is I hopefully is sinking in slowly yeah. um Klaus, you said one thing that I just want to like question a tiny bit which is that this is the u.s is the only country that can cause that kind of change like um china is currently making 60 percent more electric vehicles than there is global demand for right now like when china decides to do something half of which is really stupid policy and kills a lot of people but when their leadership decides they, they can just kind of force the issue and make change on a scale we our population is the rounding error of china's population we're the part after the dot um, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm just saying, there's something to say for authoritarian regimes' ability to pivot and and dodge. 
um, they often do exactly the wrong thing, but they're very flex sometimes. Well, you already summed it up. They often do the wrong thing. And the entirely. Thing China, China works top down. Yeah. This challenge right now is can only be solved bottom up because you have to engage the population. Uh, and China basically copies what the U.S. is doing and then oftentimes does it better than we, we are doing it because the way they execute it. But the ideas, the design uh, originate here in the U.S. Especially like Chinese food. Like we originated it, but they're doing it so much better than we are. Um, <laughs> Stacey. Yeah, two things. Um, thank you, Klaus. I hadn't even heard about that lawsuit, which kind of surprises me. That doesn't seemed to me something that Trump would do, at least when his brain was better, because what that does is it highlights his rape conviction. So that's really surprising to me. The, the bus lawsuit, end effect. The lawsuit that I did hear about was the one he filed um, with the FEC, what is it, FEC, FEC violation, trying to get Kamala from getting Biden's war chest. That's the violation that I saw, which makes more sense because he's trying to say it's rigged, it's fixed, it's, you know, that makes sense. But the question I have for Hank, you asked who are the 200 influences? Influences of who? Because that's an important question, depending on what conversation we're going to have. Yeah, I'm I'm thinking in terms of the generic public opinion. And obviously there are different publics in America that have opinions, but are there people who everyone listens to? Are there people that MAGA Republicans and uh, extreme left-wing Democrats also listen to and respect? That is sort of the nature of my question. Uh, when we, we talk about similar things here in Europe, because... Uh, uh, what's happening in America or what has happened in America in the last uh, decade is also happening somewhat slower in Europe. But we're all, always talking about who, who, which people say things that make you stop and think. And for some people, it might be the Pope, and for other people, it might have been Nelson Mandela, and for other people, it might be your father or your mother. But who are the people who say the things that stop you in your tracks and make you rethink things? And that was sort of the nature of my question. I think also different, different slices of the U.S. population are influenced by very different people. There's a bunch of people who are listening to Joe Rogan and Alex Friedman and uh, Jordan Peterson and a bunch of others. Um, and my hunch is that we have totally failed men. Men have been backfooted for the last 20 years by everybody saying it, the problem is men, which I agree with, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And with a, whole, with a bunch of attention being paid to women in different ways, which is great. And, and the men who don't know what to do are basically aimless. And when somebody shows up and says, we need to put ultraviolet radiation on our testicles. That's going to make us all stronger and better. They're like, yeah, that sounds like a great idea. And you, you just like, you thump your head, but these people have a huge following uh, and they're prolific. They're incredibly prolific online. Then you take a different slice, the pop culture people. And I was jokingly putting Kim Kardashian and Cardi B in the chat, but there's a bunch of people who are strictly into pop culture and they'll kind of swing with what's being said in those places. And they're listening to those people. And they, they're, I think they don't want to enter the political discourse and talk about those issues. They'd rather have a good time and like go party a little bit. And then there's a bunch of other slices that we could probably, if we wanted to take the time, we could enumerate and describe a little bit each of whom has different influences in different ways. And we don't have the closer to monoculture time of the 70s, 80s, 90s in the US pre-internet broadcast TV, where you have Cronkite, Rather, uh, and Huntley Brinkley before them, and all, you know, all that kind of stuff. We notably don't have that, right? Yeah, when Walter, when Walter Cronkite says, I think the Vietnam War is not working, like everybody heard that, and Nixon heard that, and he was like, ah, crap. Um, so yeah, we're in, we're in a multi-phasic, polycentric, highly chaotic and volatile 
old media plus new media world where um, uh, some influencers can rise really quickly. So I don't know, anybody anybody have a different approach to that or a, a, a something to, to add to the question about influence? Because it's, it's huge. I think you're right. And I think that's where triangulating three, three influencers where people trust what they're saying and having them discuss things is a key to this. And one, and one of the influences is usually local, somebody that you know. Mm -hmm. So it's like somebody that you know discussing what two people that you don't know, but that are both somewhat trustworthy in terms of the way they speak and the facts that they interject. I think that's part of the equation. Mm -hmm. And having that conversation where the parties are not trying to win. Right. You know, you can see those conversations where it's a deep discussion and they're each putting forth ideas that they agree with and disagree with. And yet they're, they're honoring the conversation as a way to, to work this stuff out and just make these ideas visible instead of, oh, he totally owned him on that one. This, you know, like, that's not the point. Um, because I, I think there are very few ideas that are 100%. You know, it's like there's always another, another side to it when you change the perspective. In this, in this apparent era of very short attention spans of nobody wants long media, everybody's just flipping through media, you know, the, end, the, the doom scroll, whatever. It's very heartening to me that a lot of people are watching a whole lot of three hour podcasts uh, or whatever, like the, you name it. But there are people sitting down for long periods of time talking about stuff, trying to piece together arguments, telling stories, whatever it might be, but assembling an argument uh, to convince people. And there's a bunch of people listening. And the and to related to your long your long form exploration of trust, um, there is something about watching people ramble, get off the subject, come back again, be, work it out in real time that you inherently trust as opposed to here's a 30 second clip that was chosen from three hours, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's one of the, one of the good techniques of misinformation is like being very selective in your edit uh, to not show the bigger picture, to not say what else they said to, you know, take whatever. It's one of the, one of the basic but, strategies. But you have to be open to letting someone say something that they aren't quite sure about. Right. And not, you just said that, and that's not true. It's like, well, maybe you don't even believe that was true. You were just thinking out loud and, and you have to have the space to let that expand and contract and kind of condense into a final thought. Uh -huh. And, and there's, there's, there's also a, a big issue uh, is uh, political correctness on campus and the cancel culture that showed up where people with opinions that were too far outside uh, sort of liberal acceptance were being canceled or something. And I think there was reaction and overreaction. I think a whole lot of stuff happened there that I have no first person experience of because I haven't been on a college campus in quite a while um, and have no kids who are and can inform on, on that situation. But um, there's something about the answer to uh, uh, bad speech is more speech right? I'm, I'm forgetting the exact quote. Uh, it's easy to find, but uh, the, the remedy to, to bad speech is more speech. Uh, I'm sure Pete will have it in about four, three, <laughs> two, one. Oh, man. No? Okay. Um, <laughs> I'll find it in my brain. Uh, the remedy is more speech. Uh, bink. Oh, interesting. I'll, I'll find it later. Um, anyway, we need to get back to being a culture. And I think we were, I think we have been on occasion, a culture that can talk about things broadly and make decisions collectively. And, you know, there've always been mistakes, drawbacks, and, and horrible situations like, hey, half the, half the country can't vote. Look, women don't have the vote. Look, you know, disenfranchisement has been our story for so long. Uh, but we're past those things, we think, 
until somebody, of course, weakens the Civil Rights Act and then uh, manages. Can anybody explain to me how all of the attempts, I believe, by Republicans to reduce the number of ballot boxes in a district, to eliminate mail-in voting, to shorten the number of days where anybody can vote so that there are work days, so that if somebody leaves work uh, you know, to vote, they might actually get dinged at work. So can anybody explain to me how those things are legitimate and haven't been sued out of existence? There's no, there's no way. I, I, I would love to see a democratic uh, government or any government pass an amendment to the constitution that says, there will be no infringements, mandatory mail-in voting for everybody, um, and no infringements of any kind. If you want to go to a ballot box, great. We're going to put more of them around, whatever. Oh, so it's Brandeis. So I've got an article. Uh, so Whitney versus California is the case, right? I think that because I, I looking for the quote got me to Whitney versus California, but not to the full explanation. But thanks, Pete. I think what this whole Trump saga has brought out is the ugliness that's still inside of our the society. You know, the southern states, I mean, it's just incomprehensible. And when you when you look at uh, the history and this is now uh, uh, an issue that uh, that uh, is is really rising to the to 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 a level of consciousness where uh, you look at the American Indians, you know, and and what has been done to them pretty recently, right? I mean, this is like we're talking in the sixties and seventies when they still were forcibly taking children into these schools. When you think about millions and millions of people, and really also uh, the the racism you know, of uh, uh, the Catholic Church and how um, how you know, white people have uh, really ransacked the, you know the, the the planet I mean it's it's uh, it's absolutely astounding and um, and when, when I was uh, working in China, the Chinese are keenly aware of this and they're teaching that in their schools, right? I mean, the Boxer War and, and, and all of these uh, uh, events there, the opioid wars and so on. India, you know, India is keenly aware of how they got abused by the uh, by the British. I mean, incredible brutality. Um, you look at South America, anywhere, you know, South America, and then you travel in Europe and you see the incredible wealth, you know, the plunder that uh, uh, created cities, uh, you know, you know, like uh, Barcelona, like Rome and London, you name it. You know? And uh, so, so, so there, there is. There, I mean, this is a really transformational time when you have an emancipation taking place, you know, of uh, uh, of uh, uh, different racial groups. Yeah, so so the and 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 you know, a lot of it is to defend perceived privilege, you know, in in here in the U.S. Um, I don't know. It, it's um, uh, it's uh, it's a tough one to 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 iron out. But Trump really took the lid off you know, this uh, uh, these these feelings, and that's really that's really. And maybe that was necessary. Maybe you have to let it steam up you now. Come out in the open. Thanks, Klaus. Another great irony for me is how Europeans and Americans are all anti-immigrant, like in such a big way. And in particular for Europeans, I'm like, dudes, this is just colonization coming back to bite you in the ass. This is all it is. You went and wrecked all these people's continents and lives and religions. They now speak your language. In most cases, you forbade them from, from their original cultures and squeezed them to be like you. Now they're looking for work. And you, of course, didn't do them any favors economically either. You mostly like plundered their, their resources. Um, so they're home to roost. Anyway, it's your So I, I, su I suppose in the next uh, iteration, they'll be going to China because China is now uh, taken over from uh, Europe in terms of plundering the resources of uh, uh, Africa, South America, and Asia. Mm -hmm. 
the Chinese are actually very racist. I mean, I had some experiences while I was working in there that and I, where I confused uh, a Han Chinese uh, executive, uh, uh, asked him if he's Mongolian, and he reacted like I had slapped him in the face. <laughs> now, wow. Um, I mean, yeah. Th so that that's that's uh, that's really intense uh, in in China as well. I imagine the Mongolian reference is particularly freighted because the I don't know Chinese. Well, had the meeting the meeting was in in a Mongolia you know, with a company. Yeah, uh, we were negotiating with and. Uh, the guy, I mean, you couldn't tell physically, you know, he was not uh, typically Chinese looking, but uh, um, not the reference you know, that, that anybody in this position could be Mongolian was just, you know, of course, he is Han Chinese. And, and so, yeah, no, the, the uh, days, and that, that's, uh, that's pretty, there, there is nothing, nothing uh, uh, better than Thao in that group. Interesting. Uh, in Japan, in sumo, like a quarter of the wrestlers are Mongolians now, um, including Hakuho, who retired out, who was like a fabulous, fabulous Yokozuna. He was top of the heap uh, from Mongolia. He kind of was one of the people who, who caused that to happen. Stacey. And going back to what you said before, um, you know, how far along are we really if the pushback to Buttigieg on the ticket is that the ticket can't support a homosexual? Um, and the other thing I wanted to say in terms of voting, I had an interesting conversa online conversation with um, a Trump supporter about the election. And she thought, you know, I was brainwashed. And I, you know, we talked a little bit about elections and why she was getting the wrong story. And so I asked her to, you know, send me some evidence that there's been election fraud. I said, I'll definitely look into it because I spend a lot of time getting these people to trust me. Mm -hmm. So she sent me a couple of things and I did look into it. And I mean, it's, they were both like from 2019, but I was able to come back to her and show her that one, one poor woman served 30 days in jail because she delivered two ballots to a ballot box and she wasn't directly family. I mean, so all she's hearing is they're finding all this fraud. She was trying to show me. She knew the names. She got me the names, but nobody takes the time. And in fairness to them, they would be, you know, I don't mind being, I don't mind if everybody there hates me. Doesn't matter. They're not my social group. But for them to speak out, they risk a lot. You know, I mean, they're friends. They're on the baseball team and, you know, whatever. People are more willing to start speaking now. And I, you know, I forgot who it was. I think it was Doug that said, what are we going to do after? For me, it's always been about building those relationships and having that groundwork laid for whatever's to come next. And I think that all the ugliness that's come out, again, I'm looking at the pain and the trauma that men carry. Um, and it's becoming really clear to me. And I, I see a lot of positive and hopeful things that, yeah, I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs> mm, thank you for that. Um, there's a thing called the Bellman's fallacy, which is anything you say three times is true, uh, which is one of Trump's and the right's uh, strategies right now. So uh, if, if, if people in positions of high authority are repeatedly and vocally claiming that there was fraud in the election, surely there must have been fraud, right? And, and, and like lack of shame is one of the strategies now. It's like, hey, don't, don't worry. You, you won't be ashamed because look, we've got your back. We're all going to parrot the same thing. And if all of us are saying it, people will believe us. And that's extremely true. And how to undermine that. This is one of the reasons for OGM, by the way is I have a naive belief that if we had pinned to a shared corkboard someplace, the things we actually do believe and the things we did find out, even when we sat down like you did and read, you know, went through it and kind of figured it out that we might actually be able to have better discourse, but might be just uh, naive on that. Scott, please. 
Well, as we uh, get closer to the end here, me being a you mean of humanity or just this call? This just this call. Okay, because good. I don't, I don't, I don't believe that that's what's going to happen. Um, I want to go back to what Pete said about much earlier about being pleasantly surprised at how we had this kind of vacuous form for the party. And then all of a sudden it just sort of turned into this, like everyone said, oh yeah, yeah, you know what? That makes, it was like the gear went, oh, okay, there we go, there we go. And you can plan that stuff. You can think about it, you can try, but you, you never know, right? And I just, to me, that's, I think that's hopeful. That was optimistic to me, that it didn't take long for me to say, oh, yeah, okay, I can make that work, you know? Um, and I, I think that that's, um, you know, we get we have stuff to deal with, right? But um, one step at a time. And that felt like a big deal that what Pete was talking about, how we, there wasn't a center of, of Democrats. It was with all these bits. And now it's like, well, maybe... Maybe there could be a center to compete with the other group that has right or wrong as a center, you know, and I think that, that there's a lot of them that disagree with it, but it's still a center. And if we can get our center elected, then, then that'll be good for all of us. And I think that we haven't had that. So that was hopeful for me. Thanks, Scott. Other thoughts? Picking up on, on the thread of the last few minutes uh, and turning the mirror to ourselves. Uh, well, there's seven people on the call and there were at a certain point a few others who dropped off, but there are a lot of people in open global minds. Is there something we as people in open global minds can do to focus attention on A or uh, call out lies on B or, uh, I mean, we also, I don't know how many people are actually in open global minds. Let's say there are a hundred people, uh, all have our own networks and some of the networks go very far. What, what do you think we can do? You made me want to say we have 2 million members, just like yeah. Trump's audiences. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Probably something like 300 people uh, oh. between between the, the OGM Google group and people showing up on Mattermost and people showing up on calls. We may be at that number of, of whom a whole bunch came through and, and kept going. So I haven't, haven't necessarily returned. Um, and a piece of what we can do is what we talked about earlier today, whether it's uh, calls and postcards and deep canvassing, uh, things like that. Uh, I have a naive wish, hope, that putting some ideas out in, in the, the public sphere about how to handle this transition, what to do you know, strategically between now and November might be helpful. So let's do that and then let's help everybody, um, let's help everybody echo those. Let's get those out there. Um, Quinn Norton, she's had such a hard time. It's uh, yeah, thank you for pointing to her, to her pieces. Go ahead. Uh, Quinn, Quinn's had a, a tough life, yeah. And yeah. Um, and you may or may not like her. Uh, find out more about her before you decide that you don't like her. Yes. Um, the, those two pieces I, I thought were really brilliant um, because she says the whole idea of white people and black people was invented by uh, Virginia politicians in the 1600s. Um, basically, if you say, hey, <laughs> you know, because there were a whole bunch of different kinds of people, um, uh, and if you draw a bright line and then say everybody below this line sucks and everybody above this line is awesome. Um, the, the interesting thing that happens is all the poor white people who had it just as bad as all the, you know, all the, well, not all the black people, but the poor uh, white people are like, oh, yay, we're, we don't suck. We're, you know, we're above the line. And they actually had it kind of worse than a lot of the black people. Um, but that kind of just perpetuated and, and turned into a, a, a nasty cultural divide. I, you know, there's a, a whole bunch of 
uh, other threads uh, in there, but um, but I like the way she kind of points down to this is where somebody drew the line and why they drew the line, and then what kind of just falls after that. Uh, and you know, we still live it today. I will. Um, we had a call way back when when the movie Origin came out, which was about uh, uh, Isabel Wilkerson's book Cast. And um, in, in her thesis is that racism is a subset of caste, uh, which is any place, any time when humans create an artificial division that separates them from some other population, and then they create rules and strictures and other kinds of limits and, and whatever to that those people can't marry these people, those people can't get these kind of jobs, you know, whatever. So you can look at India and the caste system. You can look at, uh, you know, uh, American slavery. You can look at South America where they had casta. And uh, being a mestizo is different from being a criollo, is different from being a whatever. It's you mean like a panther. What? Whoops. Sorry, Klaus. Um, it uh, it just maps directly to, to those kinds of things. So um, um, I wish we could find an antidote to people applying caste strategies to us. That would be a great thing, general purpose thing. It would be like Narcan. It would be like Narcan for civilization. Because we're busy under the, the deluge of opioids, like toxic approaches toward how toward other humans, and they shouldn't be. Scott, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just thinking of that in terms of my new systems thinking, or my, what well, which is now basically thinking uh, principles and that, you know, it's only four things. Distinctions between what something is and what it isn't. Parts grouped into whole, grouped into bigger holes, split down into parts, which have smaller parts. Relationships of interaction, reaction, and then perspectives, which change. It's the same thing, depending on how you look at it. It's a completely different interpretation. It changes the distinctions and stuff. And what I'm wondering is, is it possible for us not to group, to distinguish? Because that's the fundamental, that's how that's how it, it works. That's how brains work. And so if you, like, we have to distinguish, like, okay, there's seven people. All right, so I've, like, that's the only way I can interact with this is there's seven people. Only one and, person oh, not wearing glasses and he doesn't have his video on right now. I wonder what he's doing. <laughs> well, yeah. And, and okay. Oh, wait. Okay. So now we have actually the six, the visible ones are visible ones are glasses wearing. And so without even realizing it, that's, that's a group. And, and I, Oh, uh, I love what, I love what your, I love what your Mac did to that. I, um, but anyway, I, so I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. I just wonder if it's, if it's a, if so it's there, built into the, the way that we perceive the world. So. There are, so DSRP makes sense to me and is how we see the world is how we explain things to ourselves. There are useful distinctions like, Hey, yeah. in our village, there are some really good weavers and that's yeah. Jane and Bob and Sally and Joe and whatever. And they're the weaver posse. And if I want Go talk to them. That's a distinction that's really useful. Then there's tall black people with skinny noses who will call right. Tutsi and shorter right. black people with wide noses whom we'll call Hutu. And we're going to use that fake distinction to divide this population and control it. That's a terrible, horrible distinction that caused genocide yeah. in Rwanda. Right. Yeah. So, so yeah. there are great distinctions that we make all the time. And it is a natural propensity. It's when you harness that for evil, that it's evil. Right. That seems really simple to me. Yeah, and and so it's it's the, yeah, and <clears throat> so which which comes down to the perspective, which tells you which distinctions are the ones that are helpful, hurtful, useful, relevant, irrelevant. Yeah, all of, all of that. Um, okay. Yeah. So, so uh, which on, which good, distinctions? Good distinction. Sorry, which sorry. which distinctions are useful, and what you do with distinction. Um, maybe we should well, never useful for what? So that, well, that's the problem because I'm a, I'm a basket weaver in that tribe, except I'm terrible, but I love it. 
And so now are we going to put you in the, the basket weaver group because you love it or because there are pinball game designers and then there you're are not other good. people. Yeah. I, like... I, I think the there's utility of distinction. And then the the real problem is discrimination because of distinction. Saying all the basket weavers uh, you know, can never play volleyball. Um, we should put them all to death. Baskets yeah. are evil. No, seriously, that that's what happens. Yeah. yeah. Um, before we all melt away, and since yeah. we don't have Ken, I wanted to read a poem I read before in OGM just to take us out. It's uh, K. Ryan's Home to Roost, and I love it, and it seems appropriate. So, Home to Roost. The chickens are circling and blotting out the day. The sun is bright, but the chickens are in the way, yes? The sky is dark with chickens, dense with them. They turn and then they turn and turn again. These are the chickens you let loose one at a time in small, various breeds. Now they have come home to roost all the same kind at the same speed. And I think that's what's happening right now. Yeah. I think that is a marker of the moment. That is a marker of the moment. All the crap we have pulled everywhere is coming back to roost. And we don't, and we don't have good ways to deal with it. We don't have good human ways to deal with it. Call out culture is fucky. There's something uh, uh, called call in culture, which is what most healthy communities do. There's a couple essays that are open in tabs in my browser that I mean to read and comment on because they're trying to present a, a good way to move forward, right? Anyway. Yeah. That, that's a beautiful poem, and it's the right sentiment for 2024. And I, I just want to bring back one thing for, uh, for consideration uh, before we all leave. And that's something which I think Klaus said earlier on, or maybe it was... Uh, who it said was Doug. It? I think it was Doug. Oh, Doug, yeah. Uh, even more important than in the months up to the election is our ability to get society ready for the crisis times after the election. And uh, I might even suggest that as a, as a topic for another OGM conversation in the future. I like that. I like that. Um, maybe next week we do check in the weekend after the weekend, the Thursday after that, we could do uh, what, what, what are positive things to do after this, yeah. this election cycle? Yeah. Is there, is there life after this election? Yeah, I mean, there's the lar there's a larger question of how would you set up a good society and what would you do to get us from where we are today to that? Mm -hmm. Something like that. Something like that. Anyway, thanks everyone for a great conversation. Thanks for joining us when it's late where you are. Nice. Appreciate it. Just dinner time. <laughs> oh, good. Good. Not that late. Yeah. Yeah. But Doug, bye -bye. Was, in, Doug was in Bangkok. Whoa. <laughs> bye, everyone.